good afternoon to all of you. I'm Dr. Padma Gunratna, President Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, initially, let me welcome all of you for this uh, um, our usual webinar organized by the expert committee, SLMA expert committee in medical rehabilitation. Uh, this time we would be, uh, uh, let me uh, request all of you to make your microphones mute uh, so that uh, we minimize disturbance. Uh, our presenter here today is Professor Nathan Weitlingham. Uh, he's the Dean School of Occupational Therapy Perdana University, Malaysia. He's, the, he's an honorary fellow, World Federation of Occupational Therapists. Now, uh, Professor Nathan Mytilingam is a consultant occupational therapist with vast experience of more than 48 years in occupational therapy. He was graduated from British College of Occupational Therapy in 1976. It was much earlier than even if uh, even I opted for medical education. <laughs> the, uh, the, his postgraduate studies uh, were in Australia uh, and uh, he has he, uh, obtained diploma in health science and then masters in applied oh. science health. And then he has a uh, vast experience uh, of, with international uh, working in international arena uh, in London, Singapore, Australia, and now he's in uh, uh, Malaysia. He's a well-recognized uh, uh, professional uh, for physical rehabilitation. His area of interest is in functional clinical evaluation um, and ortho in orthopedic trauma and particularly elderly care, emphasizing in occupational outcomes. Uh, he was the Vice President, World Federation of Occupational Therapy from 1994 to 1998. He is uh, passionate in uh, promoting healthy aging. So uh, we, uh, I think that we are very fortunate to have uh, Professor uh, Nathan Weitlingham as a resource person uh, of these programs, I mean, series of talks that is being organized by the Expert Committee in Medical Rehabilitation. Uh, SLMA expert committee, and uh, we are thankful to uh, Doctor. Uh, uh, we are thankful to Mr. Nandana Velage for introducing uh, Mr. Vaitilingam uh, uh, to our forum. So, uh, with that brief introduction, uh, let me invite Professor Nathan Vaitilingam to commence his presentation. Professor Vaitilingam. Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Padma, for that kind introduction. Um, I, I know it's about 12 noon there, it's going to be lunchtime soon, and we are moving on to tea time here, you know, over two and a half hours difference. Uh, can I just introduce myself to say that uh, actually I'm originally a, a, a Sri Lankan in, in, in that sense, because my parents actually originated from Sri Lanka, but I was born in Malaysia, so I'm very much a, a Malaysian by birth, and uh, I love my country here as well. I've been to Sri Lanka just after the tsunami to do voluntary work through Mercy Malaysia. Uh, that was my first time I, I came into Sri Lanka. Um, I would like to uh, thank you all for inviting me to give this, this small uh, short presentation about healthy aging. And I'm sure that's a new frontier in the next uh, arena in terms of uh, globalization that's taking place. Uh, you know, health is one of the most important, uh, crucial point. Uh, I must also introduce that I'm with Pradana University. We are a, a, a medical university I started off originally. Now we have got other professions as well in, the, in our university. Uh, we have got uh, two programs. One is the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland, which is uh, the five-year medical degree program. And we also have a graduate entry program for medical students. So with, a, with a, obviously the first degree you must have to get admission. And we have got the uh, four-year degree program in occupational therapy, and uh, which is actually internationally recognized. And we also have got a master's in occupational therapy. Now we run a two-year master's program by research mode. <clears throat> so that gives you an indicator of, of Pradana University where I'm at the moment working. Uh, can I just uh, share my slides with, with you all? Um, uh, yes, yes. Uh, do you need assistance or could you? 
No, I will do it from here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, just give me a minute. Once I get into it. Um, can we? Can I just introduce myself? I, as as already mentioned, I, I actually I mean, uh, aging is one of my passion area, and it's an area that I, I am very passionate about, and I, it's one of the areas that I teach. It's interesting enough. A lot of the medical schools have now started introducing uh, healthcare for the elderly as, as part of the modules in terms of their teaching purposes, and we as occupational therapists. Uh, we have got a, a, also a, a credit, a three credit program for, the, for our third year students in terms of occupational therapy and looking at age care as a thing. I'm sure this is going to be the next wave in terms of a medical point of view, uh, healthy aging, and it's a very universal uh, issue. And if you look at WHO, they call it um, a healthy aging and, and life causes actually from womb to tomb. And I think that's the most important thing. And it's not got nothing to do with healthy aging at the age of 60 at the time of retirement. And obviously the next thing that we need to realize is the statistics. There's a load of statistics that comes out in terms of, in terms of uh, health, uh, the aging population. Now, when you, when you, when you look at, at uh, the aging population, obviously, obviously you must understand the proportion of that grows. And if you look at the things, Asia is the, the fastest growing actually. Forget about uh, the Europe. Europe has gone through it. Amer the Americans have gone through it. We are the ones that need to really focus on that. And you look at it, it is predicted by 2050, the older po population will outnumber the number of young people in the developed countries. So that's one big area that we need to realize. Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah. So if you look at it um, statistically, obviously it shows the rise in, in a, the yellow indicator shows the rise in the Asian countries itself. And um, obviously when you look at it in terms of population point of view of some of these countries that are fast growing, um, it's very rapid. Asian countries are very rapidly growing in terms of uh, aging population and obviously China and India is one. And obviously I'll show you later a slide of Sri Lanka, which has got, a, a, many, many people don't realize that Sri Lanka is one of the fastest growing in terms of aging population as well. And, and uh, in the ASEAN countries as well. So it is a myth to think that the development of uh, aging population is only in, in developed countries and uh, developing countries. It's also in underdeveloped countries as well. So some of the countries that you looked at is obviously Singapore has got the, the fastest rapid growing, but obviously the population is, uh, you know, they, you're looking at about 3.4 million people there, but it's, uh, uh, it's about to reach about 26% in 2030 itself. And Thailand, extremely fast. If you're looking at Thailand, you're looking at 22% of them. And obviously Vietnam is also fine. So many, most people never realize the development of these Southeast Asian countries in terms of aging population. Um, Sri Lanka, obviously, if you look in 2012, um, this is actually one of the, some of the study that was done in 2017. If you look at 2012, the population is over 60 million, um, was over 2.5, increases in 2021, but 2020, 41, you're actually looking at the bigger number of elderly population. So obviously, the intergenerational issues become, starts taking up uh, issue here. Children will have to take a, a major responsibility. And obviously the, 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 there's a need for clinicians, need for geriatricians, therapists who are specialized in the elderly. And I, I urge uh, many of the countries that do not, in the Asian countries never realize the fast growing of this population. And they were caught, you know, literally with their pants down, not being prepared for the aging population itself. And I think it's, it's, it is timely to, to start paying attention to this. So what is healthy aging and what are the key uh, denominators to, to this? It's a whole lot. When you hear the word healthy aging, the two things that run in people's mind is always nutrition and diet is far more than that. You know, when you're talking about healthy aging. And the, the WHO, point of view, uh, they're looking at 
uh, actually three main areas. One is the processes of developing and maintaining functional ability that enables well-being in older age. That's the most important thing, you know. I want at the age of my, when I'm 80 years old, to be functionally able to do things on my own and be independent. And this is a, the question that most older generations start looking for. My functional capacity should be able to do and reason myself and my I should have be able to value myself, value in terms of my capabilities of it and be basically to be mobile and maintain some form of cognitive abilities in me and to be able to contribute. Contribution to society is still possible even in, in the older generation. It is a myth to think that the older generation will not be able to contribute to society. There is the question of, I, many of us know that ageism, it, it is a one word that's been being thrown around these days, um, which is making people realize that the older generation has still a lot of value and contribution to society itself. So basically there are about 10 keys to healthy aging. Obviously the first thing is to lower your blood pressure, you know, and I think that is the most important thing. Uh, and the older generation doesn't realize this is important and what are the damages that can cause. And we know in the, in the medical fraternity, what will happen to us, obviously, stroke, uh, CCF, heart, kidneys, and all this becomes an issue in, in terms of damages as well. So it's important to look at lowering your systematic blood pressure. You know? And obviously with that, 90% of those are likely to get those between the age of 55 to 60, developing hypertension. So this is where the aspects of issues of illness processes start taking place. And obviously the, the fact, this factor needs to be taken in. So that would be your first step to look at in terms of point of view of the older generation. We know that what happens to us when uh, if it helps school, when we stop smoking, you find that you know the, it is obviously, if you're looking at the guides, obviously the number of things that happen to you you know, within 20 minutes, your heart rate drops to a healthier level when you quit smoking. You know, you're looking at the carbon monoxide level within you. And obviously, when you start looking after uh, a period of time, your re reduction in CVA is there, and you're looking at, at your risk factors of cardiac diseases, etc. So smoking cessation is one of the things, and it's easy for us in, in a clinical setting to tell a patient, you've got to stop smoking but nobody tells you how to stop smoking. And that's the, the thing. It's easy to use words like stop smoking, stop drinking and everything to our, our patients or clients. But the, the processes of it is what's the most important thing. And young uh, clinicians should be taught to run clinics of smoking cessation and also, also in terms of um, uh, all the aspects of risk factors that needs to happens within oneself. Participation in cancer screening, the early stages itself, we should look at cancer screening. And this is, uh, again, looking at aging healthily point of view. The type of cancer that and obviously we know the, uh, the CA prostate is so common among men these days, and they need to be made aware to go for proper screening. And this is one of the common issues you may find. I'm not sure about Sri Lanka, we will find this in, even in Malaysia. A lot of the um, men, men do not go for screening and they take it that this is not uh, why me, it's never going to happen to me, it's always happening to somebody else, you know, and that's a common challenge that takes place. In many, and I think even in women, proper screening in terms of CA or breast and all those sort of things is so important to go for, for uh, memo, regular mammograms when it comes to SNA. And this is something that could be easily been avoided once we know that if we can pick up cancer in the early stage itself, you know, so you, the, there's a 11 fold rise in incidence of de in developing cancer as compared to younger individuals once you're above a certain age. And this is something that we need to realize. So breast cancer, prostate, lung, colon cancers, all these are quite common uh, these days that you need to look at. So the seniors should realize this and you need to look at proper screening uh, of, of, for cancer. So we need to take steps to prevent cancer, you know, looking from tobacco point of view, getting away from physical active, cutting down alcohol. There's so many, I, you know, I can go down the list. And these are something that we should really be advocating 
to the lay public about the importance of it. So health promotion, health education is a key tool, you know, and the public health people play a tremendous role in this. And, you know, it's, it is worthwhile running short, uh, you know, educational courses and programs for the public more than anything else to make them the importance of it. So the earlier cancer is found is that's more likely to be treated successfully. And we know that immunization, we talk about this now because of COVID-19, isn't it? But influenza and pneumonia are the two main things that we need to realize that and uh, inform our older population. And most of us know that the death of most of the older generation is because of pneumonia, you know, and influenza. And these are all, again a preventable. Uh, processes if they can be vaccinated earlier and a regular vaccination of the yearly vaccination. Most of the time, healthcare professionals do not even talk about vaccination for the older generation itself. And this is need to be looked at. Uh, so it's important towards healthy aging. It's one of the things that is coming up with the Global Coalition on Aging and also um, with the WHO or the importance of uh, immunization for the older generation in between for influenza and pneumonia itself. COVID-19 has changed everybody's life in many ways. Uh, the older people need to be prioritized and they need to receive uh, COVID-19 vaccines in many areas around the world. And we need to look at that uh, on a regular basis and encourage them as well to come out of it. So seniors need to be, if you, uh, I think many of us will realize that today They've actually come out in, in Britain. Um, they're going to make it mandatory, not, not besides of the senior citizens, but the carers, because the carers are the ones they felt, especially in homes, nursing homes, bringing in uh, COVID-19. So they're making it mandatory even for carers to be vaccinated. Now, the next one that you would want to do is obviously to look at your blood glucose level. I know diabetes is one of the very common things among um, Asians itself, a very, very fast, rapid growing problem and issues that you find. So you're looking at an estimated about 35% of adults 65 and above uh, are prone to diabetes. And it's so preventable, you know, very often it's, it's a diet. And if you really look at it, it is Asian diets in some ways do contribute because we are basically rice eaters and rice, you know, by eating excessive rice, it, it converts into sugar. So this is something that, you know, we never seem to realize that it is our body metabolism is such and our love for rice is becoming a, a problem. And I'm not saying do not eat rice, but obviously do understand that what are the food that contributes towards healthy aging and that needs to be taken and looked at very, very um, regularly. And you don't want, want them to develop uh, full-blown diabetes as, uh, you know, it's not so much as uh, obese adults as such, you know. Um, can we revert back to normal blood sugar level? Yeah, I mean, it is possible without taking medication. I mean, and uh, these days, uh, you know, many people have gone into Atkins, uh, no more of Atkins diet, but they're looking at different, um, you know, uh, fasting as intermittent fasting is one of the biggest uh, things that seems to be coming up in 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 the health fraternity, looking at it of the benefits of it. So we may want to look at some of these um, diet con things that are coming. There are a lot of yo-yo diets I call it are, are going around in circles. But obviously, the, uh, you know that it is possible to help someone with the blood glucose level itself. Cholesterol is a very common thing, um, uh, especially among the Indian population. And they have done studies to show that this is actually uh, cholesterol is not so much only from your, uh, from your, it's a genetically predisposed and your cholesterol levels. And everybody talks about reducing their cholesterol, but not realizing that certain amount of cholesterol is also useful to one's health. So what do we start talking about? Oh, okay, we will start saying that maybe we should stop eating bread, butter, margarine. What are things that would be recommended? Should I go into skin milk? There's so much of debate that takes place, but obviously to me, and if you look at most of the people in terms of healthy aging, everything with moderation, it helps itself. So you want to lower your cholesterol levels. You look at your meat, your meat preparation, whether you should deep fry it and ghee and butter. So at one time, ghee used to be one time uh, uh, 
accepted in, in and now it seems to be making a comeback you know uh, uh, in terms of uh, health point of view uh, for cooking purposes and everything and uh, are sweets bad for one's health you know as I said there's no such thing anything that's bad but anything in moderation that you know it, it, you know turmeric has been known to be of you know doc, it's documented huh? we don't I don't have to uh, say this to, to all of us but you know turmeric there's certain ingredients of for cooking uh, has been shown of, of, of value in terms of our health itself. So physical activity, it's, it is one of the gold standards. You know, in, and not realizing physical activity is, is also includes in your leisure time, you know, in many ways you can do it. Basically you're looking at 10,000 steps a day or you know, you're looking at uh, one, uh, but, you know, one hour to one and a half hours of exercises. Sometimes could be an aerobic in nature. It doesn't need to. Sometimes, and I one of the ad, common advocates is just go for your regular walks. And many of the uh, centers, like in, in, when uh, gardens now they have developed in such a way, making it accessible for the older generation to do some regular exercises. I, I, one of the arguments people always ask me is, is housework considered exercise. Exercise is something consistent. Yes, that's not housework can be considered as exercise as long as there's some burnt out that you do in your calories. But whether you're doing it on a regular basis, that's next uh, issue. So exercise has to be consistent. It improves your cardiovascular point of view, your mus muscles, your bone fitness. You know, it helps you in terms of your bones, in terms of even helps you because helps you out because of your, uh, in terms of uh, depression and uh, cognitive aspects of things as well. So uh, you need to look at it on a regular basis. Bones, joints, and muscles are the important factors. Obviously in, in the elders, the elderly population, we know it's a hip, wrist, and spine, you know? And if you're lo uh, losing your muscles, obviously your hypothena muscles is one that's pass in the older population that goes and they have a problem of holding in terms of grip strength, et cetera. So maintaining uh, your hypothenar muscles is important factors as well. So arthritis of the knee is common um, and sarcopenia is very common among uh, Asians generally. And this is obviously partly because of low physical activity and uh, uh, intake. And one of the, 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 the culprits here is obviously our famous uh, TV. We sit in front of the TV and get glued on it, or get addicted to it for sometimes watching uh, programs. And sometimes, so it's very important in terms of physical activity that should be encouraged in, from the younger population right up to old age itself, you know? So this, it's important because your muscle weaknesses likely to develop osteoporosis. And obviously once you start developing this because of, of bad nutrition, calcium, obviously you end up with having pain, disability and loss of independence and obviously that leads to death itself. Common places where you have injuries in, because of your bones is obviously studies have shown is in, in, in terms of uh, community development basically is because of, uh, it's in the bathroom. So, you know, most common uh, places where old people fall and the injury is so high, uh, you're looking at about 80, 81% of this is likely to uh, happen. So. Uh, the, the toilet accessibility is so important as strategies for making it accessible and making sure it's a safe environment itself. This to me is a very important aspect, uh, social context, maintaining uh, social context. Beautiful studies have come out in Hong Kong in terms of reminiscence of the past. You know, and this is so very important where you get uh, older generations sitting together and talking about their past and what they've experienced in their past and uh, listening to them. They, and you'll be how, surprised how enriched the people have been because of, of talking to you about their past itself. And this is where a lot of uh, people in the rehab arena uh, encourage social interaction and you're looking at community settings. Daycare centers are very useful and we need to encourage more daycare centers, not just having a daycare center, people sitting in front of a TV, but carrying on structured activities. And sometimes it could be reminiscence activities that are useful itself. 
And this is a beautiful thing that comes out. Depression is not a normal part of aging. Many people say, oh, it's common when you get old to get depressed. Why should you get depressed? I, I, just because you're, you know, the important thing is to feel good and enjoy aging. You know, I feel that most of us do not enjoy aging. We all look at aging as, as if it is uh, taboo. It is, uh, it's going to be a, a sad thing in your life when you get old. It doesn't need to. Huh? So depression is something that you need to combat, depression and loneliness of aging itself. Dementia is again, a, not a normal part of aging. People will tell you, oh, she, uh, she can't remember because she's aging, that's normal. You know? No, it can be in any way be helped to be, uh, may not to, ex uh, to accelerate it fast, to assist them in, into this. And very often you find that the, oh, it's happening mainly in the low and middle income countries and you're looking at about 10 million new cases per day. This is again, not my figures, but WHO figures. You're looking at, you know, overall with dementia, it's very fast growing again in developing countries itself because a lot of uh, emphasis is not looking at structured activities for these people. And that's so very important. So you're looking at, in, in, in Sri Lanka, you're looking at the dementia by 2050, look at the rise that takes place and this is something that it can be sorted out and making sure that um, by having uh, in now itself to make sure you have got proper centers uh, to screen these people using uh, you know, some, uh, simple screen tools. And a lot of um, OTs have got a lot of assessment tools that could be used. And again, uh, this is something that we can help to prevent them from deterring very fast itself. So we meet, need to understand a lot of uh, memory lapses that we have. And just because you have one memory lapse doesn't mean you're suffering from Alzheimer's. Uh, you need to screen it. You need to make sure that they are there. So the most important thing is, you know, to, you know, some of the things that go is through misplaced items, forgetting names, forgetting where you left your house key or whatever. And that does not mean I've got Alzheimer's. And you need to do proper screening and this is where your, uh, your geriatricians and psychogeriatricians are so important to get into. And this is something that uh, there's the country and developing countries need to build up the capacity of professionals in this field. So a healthy lifestyle is the one that helps to reduce the risk, but it does not mean that you will not get, but you can actually prevent it from deterring rapidly. It's important to keep brains active and your cognitive abilities as well. You know, uh, that's so important. So you need to look at learning something new uh, helps. They, the studies have shown learning a new language it helps. Go and learn uh, Russian or Italian or maybe even learn uh, the Malaysian language, Chinese, um, Basa Malaysia or something. And I may not want to learn uh, some other language that, are, that is of useful. So please understand volunteerism is also a very useful team that keeps you going. Reading is, is a, of a, enriches you and so much. And these days, online games, you know, so any activity that keeps you uh, engaged mentally is something that you want. And obviously having friends to play board games helps as well. Now, what are the other aspects of healthy aging? Obviously, nutrition and aging is one, spirituality, recreational, financial health. There's a whole lot of gamma that let's go on with nutrition and aging. That's one of the biggest challenges, food. And obviously, mal malnutrition and undernourished is a quite a common thing over the older generation. So uh, I think that Nestle has come up with a very good tool for assessment for malnourished and undernourished. And that is the available scales that could be used to give you a guideline whether your, your patients are being malnourished or undernourished. And obviously we know what will happen when we have people who are malnourished or undernourished. So we need to look at the calorie needs of people. Look at some of the proteins that people need. Obviously calorie needs will obviously will help to strengthen your muscles and muscle mass. Uh, you need to look at some of the grains. I mean, I always say some of these I look very Western in terms of food, diet, and anything. There's is a need for the dietitians to look at what are the value of the, some of the local food itself, you know, and you find that as, that will and make sure that the people can afford those sort of uh, food. Do not look at just at legumes and 
and those sort of things where you know uh, uh, because again you need to re realize the economic scale of each country varies and so the diet we need to look at a healthy diet should be based on those sort of countries as, as i mentioned earlier dental health the i can i can assure you the last time many of us would have gone for dental screening for ourselves unless you have got a toothache you do not go to a dentist and this is something that we know that the, the risk factors because once the dental aspects go down in, in our patient, patients or the older generation obviously the problem starts when malnutrition undernourished takes place because they do not want to chew their food or eat their, and this sort of thing so regular dental checkup is so very important and we should actually encourage in, in the medical fraternity, make it a mandatory thing to assist the older generation in relation to this. It's like going for a yearly health screening. You must make the, the dental screening on a, on a regular basis as well. And taste is something that the older generation tend to lose after a period of time because of aging process and sometimes due to smoking and other medication can alter the sense of taste. So these are some things that we need to and I find that the use of herbs and spices to enhance the flavor of the food assists tremendously. You know, I mean, if you look at your the the, the uh, your cooking, and if you are worried about uh, your high blood pressure, then cut down your your salt, but add in more spices into your cooking, and that gives you the, the taste itself. So there are many ways um, to skin a cat, so you can play it in many ways around to help the older generation. Antioxidants. The father of antioxidants, Lester Parker, obviously most of us know, is uh, known for, uh, in terms of good food and rich in antioxidants. There's so many around, I mean, you don't have to look at this list, but look at within your own country list, some of the foods that has got good antioxidants and en encourage them to, towards eating those sort of food, you know? So antioxidants are so very important. And obviously calcium and vitamin D the, the beauty part of calcium vitamin D is all of us are looking at uh, taking supplements, but you don't realize the sunlight that you have. It's such a good thing that you could look at uh, for your vitamin D and sitting in, a, uh, in the morning sun and going for a walk that helps tremendously as well. Yeah. Now, if you look at the, your dietary supplements, obviously one of the biggest challenges is obviously uh, taking uh, multi, uh, multi supplements that people buy. That's the biggest, fastest growing industry in, in, in the health arena. People buying loads of supplements and swallowing supplements uh, because my neighbor is taking the supplements. I should take the supplements. It's supposed to be good for me as well. But that's not true right? because if you can get your supplements from your, if you have good, good nutrition, obviously that will help. So, so obviously you, you need certain amount. I mean, I'm not saying you don't, and obviously to get an expert opinion from a clinician in relation to this, looking at some of the supplements, multivitamins and mineral supplements and vitamin D is, when, is one of the things in some cases, uh, calcium that becomes an important factor itself. Water is such an important nutrient. Um, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm very glad to see a lot of younger generation these days carrying on water bottles and walking around because I realized that the, the importance of water for oneself and in terms of um, requirement for your body to, to keep yourself hydrated all the time, you know, so that's a very important thing. So water is, is an important tool. If simple, if many of us would have forgotten what Hippocrates told us, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. As so beautiful these words are that we should make sure that this is thrown to our, to our uh, generation that we're looking after the older generation and, and the younger generation as well. I just want to add a few things extra. One is spirituality and aging is so very important. Um, the, the aspects of uh, you know, your body, mind uh, is so very important and cultivating energy levels into oneself. And this helps to decrease feeling of helplessness and control of people. Spirituality is not just religion, it's actually uh, especially understanding yourself and looking at your inner peace within yourself. And that's a so very important. And there are a lot of doc, uh, very good documented studies coming out on the value of women's spirituality and, and, and looking in terms of uh, ability to, to work itself. So there are many types of spirituality uh, practices. 
meditation is one, yoga, you know, mind body exercises, tai chi, qigong, you know, these are the very well known um, value of, of uh, mind and body exercises and the documented studies on the value of yoga, tai chi and qigong published in very, very good uh, medical journals as well. And it's been, uh, well studied as well. Aging and recreation, you know, it is not all work, work, work. You need to enjoy what you do in life, whether you're playing games or gardening has become very useful. Painting has become, a, I mean, uh, becoming a very interested hobby for many of the young. I find that a lot of retirees now uh, love going, uh, taking fo uh, photography is becoming an in thing now, looking at bird watching. There's so many different uh, recreational activities one could do um, in, in a community setting so that you've also got inter uh, relationships. Inter, in, um, if, it's beautiful to have intergenerational uh, recreational activities that goes extremely well in, in many ways. So for them, the recreation point of view, it increases health and fitness, socializing, they're learning new skills as well. You know? So this is something useful any time that you're learning something um, that is interesting, builds up your abilities and obviously an environment and lifestyle itself. Why do we do uh, recreation? Something It's just basically gives you a positive feeling when you do something in, in leisure that you enjoy your, what you're doing. And that's fine. If you like taking a book, sitting down and reading, um, having a cup of coffee, on your own that's a, a recreational thing that yeah, it doesn't need to be all the time physical in in nature itself so that becomes a positive value for you uh, in terms of uh, aging point of view financial health this is one of the biggest challenges who is now realizing and is facing a lot of the older generation is that when you age you do not have enough money for yourself in terms of to uh, maintain yourself with age and financial health is so very important, even taking an insurance coverage for yourself for old age, looking at, especially in terms of long-term care. These are some of the things that one should start looking at it and countries should start developing. If you do a survey, and I'm sure that you, um, even in Sri Lanka, we do, you'll, you'll find there's so many people have not even have got enough savings for old age. Uh, this is similar even in Malaysia, that we have found that a lot of them use up their EPF savings the employment provident fund savings, they do not have anything for old age itself. So you may want to look at this as, as a thing. And uh, obviously you can't come at the age of 60 and say, look, I'm looking at my financial. Obviously this is a long-term thing and you should be inculcated. We are looking at healthy aging across the board from the younger generation to the older generation. So there's some form of things that you need to learn. Some of the financial issues faced by is obviously is going to cause poverty, uh, you know, the run of fraud, some of the healthcare costs, the job, the poor job markets, and so many other things that leads them to debt. And this is uh, some of the things that um, studies have shown that's happening to the older generation, especially now with the COVID-19 epidemic and people losing their jobs, it's making it worse. Uh, and this is a, a global thing that's affecting a lot of people as well. Um, and the stricter lockdowns is not help, helping them. They become vulnerable, low financial aspects of, and the older generation, we should encourage uh, most important thing is digital literacy, you know, and preventing them from declining in terms of cognitive abilities. Just a couple of days ago, the, I think it was World Abuse Day, um, World Elderly Abuse Day. And I think this is again, a worrying thing that's happening, you know, you need to know who your eldest friends are, or who your father or mother who's living alone, their friends. Always you need to get a good financial advisor. And one of the common things is obviously to report the aspects of uh, financial abuse of the older generation. You're looking at 16% of, of the age of uh, subject to some form of elder abuse in a, a, which has been done and looked at in certain areas itself. You're looking at financial abuse uh, among the family members with the older generation. So there's so many issues in terms of financial abuse that takes place among the older gen generation itself. Caring for the aged, that's a, 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 you need to train carers to look after the older population. So you need to certify uh, them to run a short courses 
worthwhile doing short courses to train carers to look after the older generation. So what would you want to consider the, the, the IADLs, the holistic care, um, to making sure that they're, they're able to manage things to consider, the IADADL, instrumental activities of daily living, the financial aspects, the ADL, you know, you're looking at the battle scores uh, of, of somebody in the 10 point scale, living arrangement, aging at home, education is another thing. So aging in place is, is a common thing that's now encouraging people to age at your own home rather than in, in, a, in a nursing home. I'm not saying there's no need for a nursing home. Sometimes you need the care. But if you can encourage people to age at their own home, that is a tremendous uh, benefit for them in terms of their physical well-being, mental well-being especially. And the important factor is it, the cost element of it. It, 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 it saves the carers tremendously as well. You need to have good NGOs to encourage aging in place and ma making people, making sure they're not becoming vulnerable in terms of, so the guide to caring for the older person is so very important in every aspect of the thing itself. So did you know that most 60 years and only three times more light to read as well? So lighting is so very important. And most of the thing, if you really look at, do some, some studies have shown older generations somehow, you know, think that they are able to move around mobile, but their eyesight is bad. And you find that very often they, trip and fall because of lighting system as well and sound, you know, hard of hearing. Um, it is worthwhile sometimes getting them to go and get their ears examined and you find it's just wax sitting there and that has actually caused them to have difficulty in hearing. And uh, this is a quite a common thing that happened. Vision impairment is a quite a common thing as well. And this will obviously, uh, you need to know how to speak to somebody when they have visually impaired you know, you need to face them. When you talk to them, you need to also uh, speak louder without shouting to make them, and sometimes it's worthwhile making it clearly and make sure the sound is, is, it is uh, not too low so that they are able to listen to you. Do not turn off your background, turn off your background noise. Make sure that there is no music at the end with blasting away with the um, all, and those sort of things when you're talking to them in a car situation, you need to sit down, listen carefully and be patient. Patience is one thing that you need to grow when you're looking after an older generation itself. And I, it's always good to have a good sense of humor and laugh with them, you know, and, and that makes them have a good feel, uh, feeling. And obviously that will re release good hormones in your body and, uh, and melatonin It's what you need. Sometimes it helps. So coming to the end of it, we all don't seem to realize we all have to die one day. And preparing for death is an important factor. What has that got to do with healthy aging? Obviously, death is something that you need to prepare and not so much for yourself, but also for your loved ones and carers itself. Why is it important? Because it's part of our life and we should understand that. Do not deny that all of us have to go through this one day uh, make sure that there is enough family and friends who can calmly execute the arrangements according to your wishes. And these days, I mean, I've come across quite a few people. I, I, I've come across who have actually prepared the, uh, what they want at the time of death as, uh, in terms of the funeral arrangements, etc., and that sort of thing, and, and even the rituals and all that. Do not forget, a lot of the older generation have even never written a will. And it does not need to be only when you become 80 that you have to write a will, but you can need to write a will at any time of your life to make sure to, it helps in the loved ones as they, um, when the time arises and when they need. So a holistic approach to healthy aging is the most important aspect. You need to look at your physical well-being, your mental well-being, your spiritual aspects, your emotional aspects. It is a holistic approach that is important, not just looking at exercise and one aspects of things of one's life. So as an old occupational therapist point of view, I, I think it's only fair that I mentioned that we play a role in many ways, um, preventing a, a falls, looking at accessibility of home, looking at uh, equipments, looking at what sort of uh, making them independent mobility function, 
looking at in terms of change of life roles, we went from retirement, preparing them for retirement is one thing. Many people do not prepare oneself for retirement. You need to look at education and able to look at participation and leisure activities. Leisure is one of the things that WHO emphasizes a, a lot in terms of a holistic approach to aged care itself. So the primary goal of OT is to enable people to participate in activities of everyday life, choose what they want. And it's, you have to give the opportunity for the older generation to choose what they want, the ability for them to participate and modify it when the time comes to support them as well. Now for the, all the seniors uh, who are born in the 40s and 50s, I was born in the 50s. I grew up in the 60s. I educated myself in the 70s. I ventured out in the 80s, I must say. I messed around in my 90s. Uh, and then I stabilized a bit in the 2000s. Got wiser at 2010. And obviously I made it to 2020 and 2021 now. So if you look at it, I've lived in eight different decades of my life, two different centuries, two different millennia. And with that, I must say, I, lived, I literally, in the generation of which I lived through, witnessed so much more in my everyday dimension of my life, not realizing that in this generation, I've even come up with a new paradigm and the word is change. You know, change is something that is so common with all of us and we need to adapt ourselves to change. So I believe in aging graceful. With that, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, Prof. Vaitalingam, uh, for that excellent talk on uh, healthy aging. I think uh, that is something uh, that we uh, really need to know. And also, uh, like, it's a new topic, uh, uh, even in Sri Lanka. There are trainees in uh, geriatrics at the moment. Fantastic. So, uh, so there are, like, few questions posted to you in the chat box. The yep. first question uh, is on the definition of an aging person the, in the current context. Okay. When do we actually start aging? If you really look at it, uh, I, uh, I, this is one of the few questions I throw to my students. When do you start aging? And they all come out and say, when, when I retire, when I reach menopause, when I reach andropause, you know, they come out with everything. Actually, when you look at it, there's so many uh, theories on aging. And one of the most common ones they say is, when your growth spurt stops. So when you're looking at aging, you're looking at when your growth spurt stops, that means you're looking around in the 17 and 18, you actually start aging already. So that's how one should classify it. But the sad part is everybody looks at aging as, as if at that time of 60, they, I mean, the cutoff point, WHO takes at 65. In certain countries, they take at 60. And if you look at some of the underdeveloped countries, people do not even live to up to 60. You know, so I would suggest that, you know, uh, you can also look at aging at, at the time of conception. And if you go back, you can say it's the time of uh, your development of a cell. And so there's so many theories of aging. So, I mean, that's a separate lecture I can give it to you on aging. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, then there's another question. As I mentioned earlier, that Sri Lanka has geriatric trainees at the moment. Yeah. Uh, the doctors are being trained and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not very familiar with the, the curriculum there but actually what uh, this person uh, who's uh, Dr. Balasuria says is that uh, there, should there be a component in the community to train these doctors I think at the moment they have been trained with the hospitals institutionalized training. Brilliant I think it's a very good question yes uh, we do it in, in uh, we have we do it in, in Malaysia we run quite a number of uh, public health programs, looking at, at the government is, uh, emphasizes a lot on aging aspects of things now because they realize that we are moving to an aging nation. So one of the things is, is I think it has to be made it mandatory in medical schools, uh, nursing, and especially in allied health professional fields, that the are important to include that in the curriculum, you know. And obviously, um, you, you need to also start looking at uh, coming up with programs for uh, sub-specialization for these people, not just doctors, but even the nurses and everything for looking at geriatric care. Um, allied health professions looking at, at um, 
senior citizen care. You know, there's so much uh, that could be done, but you need to start off somewhere. And one of the things that we did in, in Malaysia is we have got a couple of NGOs running towards looking at aging. And one of the things is the Malaysian Healthy Aging Society that we have got. Um, we, it's, a, it's a two things. One is we advocate healthy aging to the community as well as healthy, teaching healthy aging to the uh, healthcare fraternity. So we run regular series of programs. Uh, Saraji, I will, I will forward on to you uh, uh, in the, uh, soon a, a program that we're doing in October on the 10th Malaysian Conference on Healthy Aging. Which yeah, is, I will share it with the, You got that, yeah. yeah. So, you know, these are, these are things that you can actually start off um, within the uh, medical fraternity itself, because you will be surprised a lot of medical fraternity, fraternity do not understand what healthy aging is, you know? So it is a good time to start off somewhere to teach our own healthcare professionals first before you can teach the community and train the trainers. That's one of the ways to go about train the trainers and carers. And I think there's one more question where um, uh, actually about this is about the policy uh, on addressing the aging and as well as the the government uh, sector and how how do you develop a policy at the regional or the global level basically? Mm -hmm. I uh, mean, yeah, fantastic. That's a good question. I think one of the things is advocacy is one important area. And I think the, the, it, it starts from, from within oneself, one's own environment that where you work, start off building up those sort of things. And now one of the things I would suggest is, uh, I mean, obviously the, the Sri Lankan Medical Council or the association can start looking at this and, and bring it up to, uh, to the uh, people who are the policy makers and everything. If you look back, you know, in the US when, uh, the aspects of mental retardation. When did it start developing as, as a big thing there? It's only when Kennedy a, a announced, uh, former John F. Kennedy announced that he's got a sister who's mentally challenged. And then everything starts moving. You know, people realize that the, the someone prominent has come out mentioning about it and that developed. Some countries, the if you find the, the prime minister or the president of the country has got a certain illness processes, it develops extremely fast. So the council, uh, so policies can be developed. It's not so much of the policies, whether you have the policy and whether you're, you're going to make sure the policy gets down to the ground level, that's the most important thing. You can pass a lot of laws, but these are things, that, but it is worthwhile starting off uh, now itself because it's worth looking at, at it and sometimes it's, uh, NGOs help tremendously. NGOs play a fantastic role in all this, you know, and you may want to get some consultants to help you out to come up with some policy making issues in different areas itself. Uh, we, have, we have just come up with our Age Care Act, uh, the law, you know, uh, in, in looking at uh, nursing homes, the guidelines to how nursing homes should be set up, those sort of things. If you look at um, uh, age-friendly cities, I mean, I, I always, I mean, I've been to Colombo, I always think to myself, it can become a, such a beautiful age-friendly city. And because that, what, what would the benefit of it be? It, it encouraged tourism, you know, because then the older, because the baby boomers are the ones who got the money to travel and they would use that to come and they know it's an age-friendly city and it's not hard to make uh, it become an age-friendly city by just following some of the guidelines and principles of it. Also, there's uh, something about uh, uh, important aspect about poor socioeconomic situation in inadequacy and inadequacy of privacy for elderly with associated uh, limitations of personal relationships, including uh, sexuality. I think that part is also brought up by one of the doctors yeah. who are participating, so. I, 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 I fully agree. Um, one of the uh, things that is very often neglected is intimacy and aging. Uh, people think that the older generation can, uh, intimacy stops when they start having grandchildren, which is not true, you know? Um, 
this uh, I mean, it's, I feel look at it as a taboo subject. It's difficult to talk to. Uh, you find that in in terms of uh, we run a program called sexuality and disability. Uh, you know, because looking at stroke patients, looking at uh, my amputees, looking at and so I've actually got a module in my curriculum called sexual and disability for my uh, final year students itself. How to take a good sexual history and and that sort of thing with people with disability. And one of the things is obviously in aging is one big area as well. Um, I, I just saw somebody was asking, you know, in terms of educating people with menopause, you know, and endopause, because again, uh, the, the, there's so much of myth uh, in terms of menopause and uh, sexuality. And these are short courses that could be run for the, for the healthcare professionals to make them create awareness of it. I think very short, simple, uh, like a one day seminar, two day seminar, to, to highlight to them some of these issues. And that would be useful to start before. In Chiang Mai, they've got a, a, a master's, uh, sorry, in uh, Chula, uh, University of Chula Long Kong. They've got a program called Masters in Sexual Rehabilitation, a two-year program. You know, these are, uh, someone could be attending those sort of courses and then coming back to the country and, and making sure that these programs run uh, on a proper. Um, it, is, it is taking an initiative in looking at some of the issues. We know in, in, a, in, our, in our training program, some of these issues, but we do not seem to realize the importance of it because it could even save a marriage sometimes. Uh, thank you very much. I think that's uh, very interesting and important uh, for us to sort of uh, develop the curriculum in such a way that uh, geriatrics is part of our curriculum as well. Uh, I think Madam Padma is also heavily involved with this uh, subject because she is, <laughs> she is she's still the president of geriatrics. We have an association uh, of geriatrics. And there are some symposiums conducted. I'm sure that uh, what you told uh, yeah. we sort of implemented there. So uh, once again, on behalf of the SLMA uh, Expert Committee in Medical Rehabilitation, I would like to thank Professor Vaidaliga for that excellent lecture and a very comprehensive lecture, which gave a lot of insight to all of us. And hopefully uh, you will be able to join us, join with us in future as well with uh, this sort of symposia. And uh, maybe once you visit Sri Lanka, when this situation is sorted, sorted, hopefully you can have a physical team somewhere. Thank you very much, Professor Vaitalinga. And I would like to thank Mr. Nandana Velake for introducing you. And uh, so, yeah, Sort of uh, inviting you to do this lecture. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you very you. much. I mean, it, it is a pleasure having spoken to you all, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that you know if you need uh, some more in terms of uh, programs like this, we are most willing to help you. I'm, I'll be able to identify. Couple, I've got a couple of good colleagues of mine in the university. I'm sure they'll be most willing to give a couple of talks in relation to a different spectrums of different areas. And uh, we look forward to working with you all in the near future in, 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 uh, in, in terms of university collaboration is again, another possible things that we could do. So with that, I'd like to thank you all. I'm sure one fine day we will meet somewhere, sometime, someplace, yeah, very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.